got a lot to get through, so. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me this morning. Um, I'm going to start with a story that isn't necessarily about faith at all, but it is about Sunday mornings. It's a story I like to tell. I've told it many, many times, but I like to tell it for a couple reasons. Number one, it helps me get centered, takes me back to where I come from. And I also like to tell it so that you know where I come from. I simply wouldn't be here or anywhere else if it wasn't for a book called Population 485. And the book Population 485, it's just that old Can You Go Home Again book. It's been written many, many times by many, many people. In my case, I wrote about going back to my hometown of New Auburn, Wisconsin, population 485. Um, and when I went back to New Auburn, I, I keep to myself. I prefer just to stay in my room and write. Um, when I moved back to New Auburn, I, I didn't belong to any of the local churches. I don't drink, so I didn't go to any of the local taverns. I don't bowl. <laughs> I don't play softball. And I can't polka. <laughs> so there wasn't much left, so I joined the fire department. <laughs> um, I was talking with the group this morning, and I said I often get, I, I work with a lot of people out of New York City, editors and agents and publicists, and They'll find out I'm on the volunteer fire department and they say, oh, you must be very brave and noble. And I go, eh, <laughs> not especially. <laughs> and then I explain to them that when I moved back to town, my two brothers and my mom were already on the fire department. <laughs> so it's basically a peer pressure situation. But the book Population 485 has been out for 15 years now. And over the years and continuing right up to the present, including just this week, I've received innumerable letters and emails from people all over the U.S. saying, we read your book about life in the small town, and we loved it. We loved it so much that we've sold everything, and we're moving to a small town. <laughs> and I always say, well, hang on there, Spanky. Because <laughs> small towns can be very difficult places. They have long memories. You can be 50 years old trying to live down something that happened when you was 15 in the gravel pit. <laughs> And even I, I was eager to return to my hometown. I wound up having 12 of the most meaningful years of my life back in my hometown. But even I had a certain amount of trepidation because I was not the same guy when I went back to New Auburn as I was when I left. What I like to say is that when I left my hometown, I was a farm boy, a good student, and a fair defensive end. I returned 12 years later, a long-haired writer with soft hands, and a nursing degree. <laughs> so there was a certain amount of street cred to recover <laughs> with some of my buddies in the coon hunting crowd. <laughs> now, I've since had to update the anecdote specifically as it pertains to the long hair. For years, I had long hair, waist length. There are two reasons I no longer have long hair, and the first, sadly, is just generalized crop failure. <laughs> It just got to the point where there was no point. And the other reason is that it had gotten, it was still real long in back, but it started to get real thin on top. And I was looking in the mirror one day and I thought, you know, you really ought to cut it off. You're headed for the Ben Franklin look. <laughs> but I hadn't made the move yet. And then one day we got paged out to fight a grass fire on the railroad track south of town. I was right up in the teeth of the flames, knocking it down, fighting from the black, as any well-trained wildland firefighter will tell you that you must. But I was right up in there, and then all of a sudden, one of the other firefighters ran up and started patting me. Now, normally, you don't get a lot of that. So I said, what are you doing? And he said, man, your hair's on fire. And indeed, it was crackling right along, so... At that point, I thought, you know, if it ain't falling out, it's bursting into flames. So I just cut it off. So um, 
And then, so when I moved back to town, I, of course, I also I had to overcome all the stereotypes of the male nurse. I'd heard them all. I've heard them all. Um, so the deal is I grew up on a small dairy farm north of uh, this little town of New Auburn, Wisconsin. I grew up milking cows, baling hay. In the winter, we logged. At the age of 16, I started working summers on a ranch in Wyoming, a regular working beef and hay ranch. I rode Roundup, did branding, worked on the hay crew. And so I worked there for five years, five summers. So I would work there all summer, and I would take my cowboy wages, and I would come back to Eau Claire, Wisconsin, where I was going to school, uh, college, and I would apply my wages toward my tuition. I'm here to tell you I was the only cowboy in all of Wyoming who was putting himself through nursing school. <laughs> I based this on several conversations I had around the old Brandon fire. Uh, I was what they called a header, which meant they would rope the calves and they'd bring them in. I'd meet the horse, grab the rope, slide down the rope till they came in contact with the calf, and then I would uh, wrestle it and hold it uh, as it was branded. I would be down there on the ground having wrestled this calf, and some crusty old cowboy would walk up behind me with a red hot branding iron, and he'd say, Where are you from, son? Wisconsin. <laughs> what do you do? I'm going to college. What for? I want to be a nurse. <laughs> It'd get really quiet out there on the prairie. And I'll never forget the night I told my dad I wanted to be a nurse. I wasn't too worried. My father is a very gentle man, a hard-working farmer. But nonetheless, you're a 17-year-old guy. You're the leading tackler on the new Auburn Trojans football team. And you decide, tonight's the night I'm going to tell dad I want to be a nurse. It's a moment. So he was walking out to the barn after supper to milk the cows, and I was about five paces behind him, and I said, Dad, I want to be a nurse. And he stopped and he turned and he looked at me and he said, well, your mother is a nurse. It's a noble profession. I think you will make a fine nurse. And he turned and, and, and began to walk to the barn. Then he stopped and he turned back and he said, there is just one thing. And I said, what's that? He said, I just want to be there when they pin that little white cap on you. <laughs> so, so I moved back uh, to New Auburn, and basically what I'm doing is I'm just trying to, looking for signs, trying to tell myself whether or not I've made the right decision or not, despite the changes. And so the story that I tell in the book, Population 45, is that the biggest event of the year in New Auburn is Jamboree Days. Jamboree days consist basically of a five-minute parade and a softball tournament. And the proceeds from the softball tournament go to support the local park. So as members of the volunteer fire department, we're expected to pitch in and help run the, the softball tournament fundraiser. Now, in addition to the softball tournament fundraiser, directly adjacent to the softball field is a beer tent. Ain't gonna lie to you, that's where most of the fundraising happens. And we run the beer tent as well. <clears throat> now, the deal with the, the softball tournament is that New Auburn has only one softball field and no lights on the softball field. And over the years, the tournament has become very popular. And so in order to get all the teams through the brackets, they have to start playing softball at 8 a.m. on Saturday morning. They play all day long until dark. They resume play at 8 a.m. on Sunday morning and play all day long until the tournament has been resolved. So shortly after I move back, <clears throat> I get assigned the duty of going down to the park on Sunday morning of Jamboree Days to clean up the beer tent, get it ready for the day. The chief sends me down there with one of the old timers on the department, a guy named Bob the One-Eyed Beagle. <laughs> Now, the one-eyed beagle gets his nickname from the fact that he is severely cross-eyed. Um, and when I say severely, I mean that one eye is not just a little bit off. If, if, if his good eye is looking due south, that other eye is looking due east. Um, and when I describe him, he's a friend of mine. He's a butcher. He still butchers my pigs. And we've known each other all our lives. 
But sometimes when I describe him in settings like this, I can feel discomfort in the crowd. And indeed, I've had people come up to me afterwards and say it's, it's very insensitive, the way that you describe him and the terms you use. And I, all I say to them is, um, he's aware. Right? He's checked it out in the mirror and, and, you know, from both directions. And furthermore, he's one of these guys, and you all know this guy, that I is the least of his problems. This is a guy, he's got one eye, one kidney, and two ex-wives, both of whom work at the only gas station in town. So he's got to run nine miles south to Bloomer every morning for gas, coffee, and chew, because they just won't serve him at the home place. <laughs> so me and the Beagle, we get assigned the duty of going down to clean up the beer tent. We get down to the park, it's 8.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. First softball game of the day is already underway. We're in the beer tent picking up paper plates and plastic cups and napkins when this guy wanders in off the street, not a softball player, just a civilian. And he says, can I get a beer? And I said, well, it is 8.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning, but Beagle, You've been on the department longer. You make the command decision. And the beagle says, well, I guess there's no law against it. So he goes around behind our little makeshift bar there, <clears throat> and he, grab, he draws the guy a beer. He sets it down. The guy hands his money over. He puts both elbows on our little plywood uh, bar there, and he raises the beer to his lips. And he's just about to take a pull at the foam when he hears the crack of the bat on the softball field adjacent and he freezes, then he looks, then he brings his lips back in line with the beer, which has not moved, and says, little early in the morning for softball. And it was at that point that I said, yes, I am back among my people. So, so despite that particular anecdote, by the way, these glasses make me uncomfortable. I got them in a three-pack at Menards. Um, <laughs> And I thought they were kind of stylish. And then I have a daughter, I have a, my wife, and then I have a 17-year-old daughter and a 10-year-old daughter. And in our kitchen, we have a little island. And I put these on. I have a little room over the garage where I write. And I had them on. And, and I thought, yeah, these are kind of actually kind of nice. And I walked in the house, and they all three just turned and looked at me in, in unison. They just went, no. <laughs> but these are the ones that were in the van, so... Anyway, despite, <laughs> despite the anecdote that I opened with, um, my books are woven with threads of faith and spirituality, and I would say in a distant third religion. Um, Population 45, which is the book that anecdote just came from, there's an entire chapter just titled Death, which of course winds up being a reflection on faith and the future and the unknown. Um, my one novel uh, that I wrote is utterly centered on faith, and I'm not going to read it at you today, but I'll just read the opening sentence, uh, two sentences. On Christmas Eve itself, the bachelor Harley Jackson stepped into his barn and beheld there illuminated in the straw a smallish newborn bull calf upon whose flank was born the very image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, said Harley, that's trouble. <laughs> um, and even as far back when I first started, in, uh, I just looked at this piece. It's the last piece of my book off Main Street. It's called Branding God, where I wrote an essay about my faith started to crack while I was working as a cowboy in Wyoming. And... Uh, I think I'm just going to open with a couple of paragraphs from that. Brother Tim Copper was preaching brimstone, and God himself was bringing the backbeat. 
We were gathered in a long, empty Quonset-style granary, seated on wooden benches, receiving the word. All around the granary, wheat fields stretched away for miles. Brother Tim was working Revelation, if my recollection is correct, and it might not be. I had my eye on this particular girl. And the good Lord was working a towering thunder bank just off to the southwest, sliding it in on golden shafts of setting sun and legs of lightning, all the while staccato dancing his fingers across a kettle drum forged in the storms of Jupiter. The hot wind pushed sweet rain come and dust under the granary door and set the ladies' skirts to stirring. Bible pages riffled, and the young girls put their hands to their hair lest it come unpinned. Brother Tim had revelation, he had the terrible swift sword a-flashing from the sky, and he had the admonitory thunder. He had the groove. I'll give him this. He knew how to work it. The nearer that storm drew, the more the wind made the roofing nails squawk and the tin roof retch. The taller he rose, glowering from the plywood riser, squeezing the word in one hand, index finger bookmarking verses he knew by rote. His fervid eyes swept the congregation like a shark working a beach. This was no come to the warm and sheltering bosom of Christ's speech. This was an operatic Armageddon rafter rattler. Brother Tim was recommending heaven by pointing the way to hell, double-timing our sorry souls like a drill instructor assigned a platoon of pudgy molly coddles. The march was on, he said, lag and be damned. We trembled with truth. We weren't used to this sort of thing. Our Sunday meetings were hushed, reverent affairs, parsed with sadavache prayer, subdued testimony, and muted hymns. Even for this, the Saturday night service of our yearly convention, a service in which the meeting is typically tested at the conclusion to see if anyone will stand and silently profess their willingness to walk with God, the thunder from the dais was unexpected and unusual. Even I, distracted as I was by the young nursing student two rows forward and one bench down, found myself caught up in the terrible power of the whole thing, moved by the cinematics of it all. Brother Tim's bituminous eyes, his portentous certainty, the way he seemed to summon thunder each time he punched the air with his Bible. It was as if Wagner's Valkyries had dropped in on the Quakers. So I was raised in an obscure fundamentalist Christian sect. I like to say that because it makes people uncomfortable. <laughs> and actually, I was speaking with the group this morning. It was a lovely interlude. Um, I was raised in love and kindness and gentleness. My parents tried to teach us two things, charity and humility. And what I say to this day is that I no longer can pretend I believe what my parents believe, but I try every day to be more like them. And um, it was a very austere uh, faith. Um, we, you would profess at some point, they would have a gospel meeting like the one I described, and they'd sing a hymn, and then you would stand to your feet to, to profess your faith. And then later we had full immersion baptism. Um, and uh, we didn't, we had uh, preachers who were not paid. They gave away everything, and they just stayed with people in the church, and they went out two by two, which was our interpretation of the New Testament. Um, and I get asked a lot uh, if what the name was. It didn't have a name. It was non-denominational, and they took that seriously. Um, I also get asked if it was the same church Garrison Keeler was raised in, and it was not. So, but uh, <clears throat> after that, uh, after Brother Tim tested the meeting that night, nobody did stand that night. Um, but right as soon as he was done, me and that girl ran out into the wheat field. So, um, so I wrote a book where I describe my faith, and uh, it was pretty G-rated, really. But the, I um, describe my faith in, in pretty good detail, or at least my history of faith, in the book Coop. I chose the, the Coop is a, a book about my wife and I and our little family moving to the country to raise our own chickens and pigs, and um, it's also a memoir about growing up on the farm and about giving birth to our daughter. She was born in our old farmhouse on purpose. Um, it wasn't my idea, but it turned out I didn't have a vote. Um, 
it turned into a lovely experience. But uh, the book coop is the arc of the book is me trying to build a chicken coop for my chickens, and I'm I'm mechanically and carpenterally uh, utterly incompetent, and so it takes me a whole book to build a little chicken coop. But anyway, when the book came out, I thought, well, the title should be, it's about chickens. There's a picture of chickens on the cover. There's a picture of the chicken coop on the cover. So Coop is really the perfect punchy short title. And I was pretty proud of that title until the day the book came out and I did my very first, my very first radio interview. And the uh, host said, welcome everybody, author Michael Perry here today to talk about his brand new book, Co-op, which is... <laughs> So I thought I would select some readings today from that will sort of piece together that, that journey that I was on and am on and continue to be. Sunday mornings when I was a boy, I worshiped the Lord in a white clabbered house. I sat in a straight-backed chair against a hard plaster wall. In the summer, the plaster was cool, and in the winter, it was cold. The windows were narrow and tall, and the glass was ripply. A distracted little lad could rock in his seat and roll a shimmy through the trees. Sometimes when the snow was heavy on the ground and the living room was radiator warm, the boy got drowsy in his sweater and corduroys. When his head lolled back, it rang soundly on the plaster so that the window panes, resting loose in their fractured putty, buzzed like snares the racket signaling that someone was snoozing along the path of righteousness. We sat quietly until exactly 10 a.m., and then Brother John spoke. Would someone like to choose a hymn? I was always hoping for hymn number one, Tell Me the Story of Jesus, because it was my favorite, and I knew most of the words without looking, but it was usually reserved for gospel meetings. So someone suggested a number, and we paged to it in hymns old and new, and then one of the women, Florence usually, would lead the singing, hitting that first note so the rest of us could follow in behind. Once she chose the range, you were stuck with it. Sometimes you'd have to drop an octave to hit the high notes and jump an octave to hit the low ones. When the first hymn was complete, sometimes we sang another one. Then John said, let us bow our heads in prayer. The prayers rose around the room in no particular order, with the exception that John the Elder always went last. The prayers were usually brief and simply worded. Lord, we pray that thou wouldst grant us stillness in our hearts, that thou wouldst improve our spirits, that we might find ourselves worthy of thy mercy. Some prayed in a rush, some prayed briefly, some prayed a different prayer every Sunday, some prayed the same thing every week. By and large, the prayers were poetic in simplicity, in rhythm, and everything remained resolutely in the spiritual realm. Overly specific requests were seen as unseemly. Thus, I was quite unprepared later in life when I overheard a prayer session among a group of young evangelicals at a local coffee shop during which a young woman quite fervently prayed, Lord, you have got to get me out of this lease. When the prayers concluded, we sang another hymn, and then it was time for testimonies, and those who chose to participate shared a Bible verse or several that they had been meditating on during the week and then offered a homespun homily. The first time I gave testimony, it took a while for me to get my gumption up, and I quaked as I said, my thoughts this week have been on Matthew chapter 19, and then I read aloud verses 16 through 22, in which a young man asked Jesus what good things he must do in order that he may have eternal life. And then I said, after reading it, I hope that I will always live so that I am storing up riches, not for this world, but for eternity. And then the next person began to speak, and I felt great relief. As with prayer, the testimonies moved around the room in no particular order. And then when we had all spoken, John the Elder gave his testimony. When he concluded, he set his Bible aside and said, would someone give thanks for the bread and wine? Once you professed in gospel meeting, you were allowed to pray and give testimony Sunday morning, but in order to take the sacraments, you had to have been baptized. We were of the Anabaptist persuasion, eschewing infant baptism, trusting instead that when the Lord so moved us as believers, we would seek out the workers, and that's what we called our preachers, the workers, and request to be included at the next baptism, a full immersion ceremony usually held in a river or farm pond. 
I never got baptized and therefore never partook of the emblems, as we used to say. I do remember helping pass them around the room and how heavy the glass felt and how I focused intently on handling it so as not to spill it and how it seemed imbued with a heaviness far exceeding a glass of juice. As the emblem circled, each baptized person took a pinch of the bread and a sip of the wine that wasn't wine. Following the bread and wine, we sang a final hymn and church was over. It rarely went over an hour. We rose and shook hands all around. You made sure you got everyone young and old. It was an informally required formality. The grown-ups visited, and then we sorted our hats and coats from the pile in the kitchen and stepped back into the outside world for six more days. I think um, I have a book that I've been working on the last couple of years. It's coming out in November, and I have a chapter in there on faith. It, it, the book is about the French philosopher Montaigne, because the world was crying out for my thoughts on <clears throat> French philosophy. Um, but I was reading them in my deer stand one day, and I thought I should write about this. Um, it's true. But I have that, in that faith chapter in the Montaigne book, I write about uh, Ashon Crawley. is a, is a black Pentecost black Pentecostalist, and um, he writes about how he loves the old hymns, and we talked about that in our little group this morning, and I talked about how I love the, the hymns, uh, even, even though my faith has changed. But Ashan also talked about how it was to be part of a peculiar people, and that was truly one of the things that I loved about our little, she, little church, that we, we believed at that time, we were the ones and the only ones, and the rest of you were out of luck. Um, of course, I don't believe that anymore, but I still feel sometimes like, yeah, even though I left, I'm still in on the secret, and I'm fascinated uh, by the power by the power of that. Um, so I'm going to just uh, read one short little excerpt and then close. Um, I, I have a book also, Danger Man Working, where I have a whole section there called Music and Faith, because I've written about both things a lot. And there's a singer named Greg Brown, and many of you will be familiar with him. And um, this just is a summation of my faith journey through the Greg Brown. When, as a young child, you are called by the Lord to rise from your metal folding chair in the basement of the Moose Hall and commit your life to Christ upon the commencement of the final chorus of Close Thy Heart No More, you remain forever susceptible to the lexicon of faith. All subsequent straying will not alter this fact. You are hooked on the thee and thou and always will be. You will toddle along into a life of scuffling and singing and just keep on a wandering. And one day you will hear someone railing on these scary fundamentalist Christians and you will pick up your bumbling agnostical head from its existential dreamland and you will say, hey, those are my people you're talking about. <laughs> And you will look back down the path you have trodden and you will not be able to feature the circumstances under which you would return to faith and fold. But likewise, you cannot imagine where you would stand lacking the reckoning point set by both. Having wrestled this contradiction every day since the Moose Hall, you will remain peeved with those who think you left the flock because you are a silly little sheep. But you will be grateful for the foundation the church provided even as you stack your bricks in the sand. I was raised a fundamentalist Christian boy in a sex so ascetic we were taking the Christ out of Christmas long before the term secular humanist even existed. We had no name, we did not believe in church buildings or preachers' investments, and we did not decorate trees. We gathered in regular houses and sat in straight back chairs, constructed our own homilies, and offered our own prayers. We practiced full immersion baptism. Televisions and radios were forbidden, and our sacraments were bread and grape juice because alcohol was the devil's gargle. We sang unadorned hymns, a cappella. You'd hear the men grinding away at the harmonies down below and the younger women rounding out the middle range. And high above it all, I am thinking especially of the times we held meetings in a barn and the sound had room to rise, the melody carried by old women in plain dresses singing in guileless falsetto. They took it right to the rafters. You ease away 
years pass. You read Being and Nothingness. Then one day, several years after its release, you get a copy of Iris Dement's Infamous Angel. And when Flora Mae Dement's voice comes soaring out those speakers, you are right back in the barn, ready to rise and profess again, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. And yet you crave the wisdom of sinners. Thanks so much. I'm watching the clock and I've hit my limit. Um, so I'm going to close now. Um, I'm very, very grateful uh, to be here. And I think one of the things that I so appreciate about gatherings like this and the gathering we had this morning is it, I mentioned the part, the, the one time when I will get cranky with my people is when they assume that I just wandered off tra-la-la. I did not wander off tra-la-la. I think about these things every day. I have children. I have to tell them my truths. And um, I do the best I can, but I try to operate from humility and charity, as my parents told me. I feel a lot of that in this room today and in the group that I was with this morning. So I'm grateful to have been part of it. And the final thing, and what I'm going to close with, is I try to operate even and especially in these times from gratitude. So thank you so much for having me. I will stay after and visit as long as you want. Although I do got a driver on that great big lake to get back home. <laughs> I did take the ferry and they canceled it because of the wind. <laughs> so. <laughs> so thanks again so much. I'm going to close with gratitude. This is the piece I wrote about two years or ago when I felt like some things were getting askew. It happens that this essay is being composed in the waning days of December and thus on the cusp of a new year. I cannot anticipate the state of our hearts as we meet in this moment, but I choose for my subject a word I owe more study whatever may transpire after I type it. Gratitude. Gratitude. Such a lovely word. Humble and warm. Humble because it's not a word you use if you think you did everything yourself. Humble because no matter how hard you did work at whatever it is you're grateful for, you know and more importantly acknowledge there was some luck involved. Warm because gratitude is not compatible with a cold soul. Warm because gratitude radiates like the gentle rays of a heart-sized sun. Gratitude goes softly out and does good works, which generate more gratitude. Gratitude is renewable energy. Gratitude because to offer anything less would be to ignore all privilege, the privilege of existence, the privilege of health, the privilege of privilege. And now we're back at humility, or ought to be. Gratitude because the world is awash with the sour surf of opposing sentiments. Gratitude for those who show us the same. Gratitude even in grumpiness, which is to say I'm not talking all hosannas, hugs, and puppies here. I'm talking about perspective and preponderance and relativity and a sideways glance into the cosmic mirror where behind me I spy millions of souls who would give all they own for just one of my disappointing Tuesdays. Gratitude as my moral duty. Gratitude because it's so easy. A note a word. You don't even have to talk. Gratitude can be soundless. You can speak it with your eyes, share it with a smile, weave it into your works. You can kneel down and offer it up. Gratitude, a triple syllabic salutation to the six directions, whichever way you're pointing. The echoes go on and on. The echoes are gratitude returning. Gratitude is a practice, as an intentional act in the form of reflection, a quiet moment, a look back. Gratitude not as obligation, but as celebration. Gratitude with our loved ones in mind, the ones who suffer our ingratitudes with grace, and that grace yet another reason for gratitude. Grace, cousin, and catalyst to gratitude. Gratitude because as this year or this day or this hour or this moment draws to a close, I am reminded it was another year granted, not guaranteed, and therefore not taken for granted. 
Gratitude, no matter the season. Gratitude. Thank you very much.